Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm, I'm so excited to be in Toronto, such a beautiful city. And everyone's so nice. And I noticed how they all wait to cross the street until it says to walk, which is <laughs> so anti-New York. I love it. Um, I want to thank Tamara and Marta for inviting me and making everything so organized and beautiful. So, and thank you all for coming tonight. It's very cold. <laughs> I have long johns on over here. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So I noticed, actually, with my title, on Tuesday night, I was giving, um, I was moderating an artist talk at the School of Visual Arts in New York, mm -hmm. and one of the things I talked about was um, our mission being to support Latin American and Latino artists. And someone in the audience talked about the racism he felt was inscribed in the term Latino, because it seemed to um, insinuate that there was not a Native American presence uh, in that naming, um, and so. Seeing the title here again, I would love to have more conversations about that if we are interested in a debate like that. There's such a long debate between the term Latino and Latin American and what those really mean, and I think it's part and parcel of what El Museo is about. So I'll start really with that. <clears throat> El Museo del Barrio was founded by a man who liked to destroy things. Films, sofas, pianos, mattresses, cabinets, televisions, you name it. Thanks to these avant-garde gestures, by 1961, he was already included in exhibitions at mainstream museums like the Whitney. He was included in their annual before it became the biennial. Just a few years later, however, and after earning a PhD in art education, he made the following statement. The cultural disenfranchisement I experience as a Puerto Rican has prompted me to seek a practical alternative to the Orthodox Museum, which fails to meet my needs for an authentic ethnic experience. To afford me and others the opportunity to establish living connections with my own culture, I founded El Museo del Barrio. I think this means we have an important job to do. El Museo explores and presents the broader world of art production, mostly by creators from regions south of the Rio Grande. In addition, however, we are deeply invested in the artists whose families hail from those regions, but who make their lives and their homes north of the Rio Grande. And because New York City is the largest Caribbean city outside of the Caribbean, we often use our own backyard as a site for investigation. This attention is especially important because our founder, when he spoke those words, had never had the experience of being a person from Latin America. Born in Brooklyn, he is what later generations of his kind would self-identify as New Yorican. The legacy of Rafael Montañez Ortiz continues to influence the way in which we explore and represent the cultural production of Latinos in New York. My work, though grounded in the modern period of the Americas, has focused mostly on the work of living artists, all of them under-recognized in a country where they nevertheless participate in the development of contemporary American art. In an important moment in American history, artists protested the hegemony of museums like MoMA and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Representing the artists was the Art Workers Coalition. A subgroup of this entity, oh, that's our founder protesting in front of the Museum of Modern Art. A subgroup of this entity, the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus, protested the lack of representation of Black and Puerto Rican artists in the galleries and also in the permanent collections of these powerful institutions. In films, on television, in books and magazines, in the educational system, in the production of knowledge, everything, in essence, that pertained to the reality of the moment, the faces, the bodies, the ideas, and the contributions of people of color were invisible. In museums, works of art by Puerto Rican or African American artists were never seen among the works of art that represented the modern or contemporary periods. It was a partial reflection of New York society and of urban populations in the United States. This is where El Museo del Barrio was born. In order uh, to continue, you know what? I think I might need a little more light. Um, in order to continue to follow the initial objectives of the Puerto Ricans who formed this community, today we always ask, our, ask ourselves how can we transform 
the way of thinking about the history of American art. Um, to reflect a reality that has already been developing for over 100 years. It's a reality that is being experienced not only in the urban spaces of the country, but also in the suburbs and in rural communities. Which is our America? In the largest Caribbean city in the world, the question is crucial, and we know that the answer has to attend to multilingual, multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multiracial interests. So, one of the reasons I call this talk sort of four moments is because I'm looking at four almost little snapshots of different periods um, from the late 1960s through the mid 1990s, mid 2000s actually. Um, and the idea is to think about how we can integrate more artists of Latin American descent into the canon of American art history. And this is just such an interesting kind of um, statistic by the time the Museum of Modern Art opened in its new building where it is now in the late 1930s, they had already planned for a solo exhibition of work by Diego Rivera to be among the first exhibitions that was planned for that space. And then literally five years later, a show of contemporary Cuban art. And so it's interesting to see how um, those kinds of dialogues sort of discontinued throughout that history of the Museum of Modern Art almost really until 1992 when they did the big exhibition uh, of the, uh, on the quincentennial that was modern and a little bit of contemporary Latin American art, but not the kind of attention that was given to it when Alfred Barr, for example, was there. I mean, part of that is the Rockefeller interests, you know, but still. So one of the things I'm always interested in thinking about is how can we reinforce the idea of an American art history that is more complete by revealing, or in some cases just acknowledging, the close relationship between Latino and non-Latino artists. To discuss cultural production in general without reference to race or ethnicity, to see the ways in which all artists engage with similar problems or ideas. So the four artists that I'm gonna talk about have similarities. They work in American art history because they deal with local subject matter that reflects issues that are of broader interest, in some case global issues. They, you see in their work representations of the body or its presence, destruction of the body or the landscape, the influence of urban and popular cultures, and also an exploration of how all identities are constructed, how race and gender are also constructs. So moment one is Rafael Montaigne Ortiz. In 1966, a group of artists gathered in London at the Destruction and Art Symposium. Armed with their critical theories, about the process of destruction as a creative act. Among the artists invited to perform was the destruction artist, Rafael Montañez Ortiz, who was then known as Ralph Ortiz. He's the one, uh, the tall one in the back, tallest Puerto Rican I've ever met. Um, and this was common actually for people to change their names or to anglicize their names, so often you'll have to look up a particular artist under both their Spanish name and their English version of their name because he was Ralph Ortiz in the 1960s. Montañez Ortiz represents a major figure in the history of performance in the United States, though his contributions to the field remain underrecognized. His work became simultaneously too conceptual for the barrio and too ethnic for the mainstream. As Chicano scholar Chon Noriega has noted, quote, by the end of the 1960s, Ortiz would be erased from the history of art, falling into the widening gap between an avant-garde refigured as postmodernist and therefore non-ethnic, and an ethnic art defined in terms of cultural nationalism and modernist aesthetics. Ortiz's larger body of work, and particularly his performance work, have a substantive and I think significant relationship to the history of art in the US, <laughs> but also to other artists who are doing performance and conceptual work elsewhere in the Americas. Chilean, Brazilian, and Argentine avant-garde artists such as Marta Minujín, Elio Tizica, Pase Rasuriz, and Carlos Lepe were actively engaged in similar work in their homelands at the same time. Ortiz was deeply interested in public participation in the creative process, in freezing particular moments of creativity, in chance and coincidence, and in the relationship between the creation of an artwork and the destruction of an object. For the artist, avant-garde practice relied heavily on these ideas. According to the Destruction and Art Symposium press release, the principal objective of the event was, quote, 
to focus attention on the element of destruction in happenings and other art forms, and to relate this destruction in society." Unquote. The artist further maintained that, quote, although ideas of destruction have played a very important part in the course of 20th century art, such as futurism and Dada, it is only in the course of this decade that destruction of materials has been systematically incorporated in the practice of artists, unquote. Events were scheduled to occur throughout London. Participating artists were invited from Austria, Belgium, Great Britain, France, Germany, Holland, Mexico, and the United States. So it was a huge event. Principally, the artists who gathered around this movement and its development were opposed to the senseless destruction of human life and the landscapes engendered by war. They hoped to demonstrate what they called the relevance of destruction in art to the social, political, and cultural situation. Ortiz described his feelings upon arriving in London, where he was part of an international gathering, not only of artists, but also of poets, musicians, and psychologists, interestingly. He said, I literally thought of it as an Olympics. I was going there to show all the rest of the artists who worked with destruction that I am really in charge of that process. I organized performances for the first time that were much tougher, much more psychologically probing, much more confessional and embarrassing in a way. I thought for a while about the line that I would not cross and then decided that I would cross it because this was a competition. I was facing a commitment to an aesthetic that I wanted to be in charge of. Although he had never organized public actions like these before, Ortiz planned and performed a series of seven public destruction events that included two chair destruction rituals, one mattress destruction ritual, two piano destruction concerts, two paper bag destruction concerts, and a self-destruction realization. Of these events, most were publicized in local papers, and uh, both of the piano destruction concerts were filmed by ABC and the BBC. And then later he appeared on the Johnny Carson show talking about his piano destruction concerts. He was also asked to participate in a public discussion about the destruction and art symposium with other artists that took place at London's ICA. His chair destruction ritual was significant for the intervention it posed into British social practices. After arriving in London, he learned about the, popular, po the popularity of these social clubs that men of a particular class belong to. And the idea was, you went to the social club you bought a chair. The chair was yours, and you could go and have a drink and read the daily papers and meet with your friends and sit, sit in your chair. But what he realized also was that um, a lot of men didn't necessarily sit in the actual chair that they bought. They might go sit in someone else's chair to chat with their friend and be closer to them. And so he bought a chair to belong to, part of, to this, uh, this club, and um, he, he announced that his performance was going to take place at his club, and to his delight, someone was in fact sitting in his chair at the beginning of his performance. When he asked the sitter to please move from his chair because it belonged to him, he was greeted by disbelief, and a waiter was summoned for verification. <laughs> Ortiz's ownership was, of the chair was established, and when the man got up from the chair, Ortiz immediately took action. I leapt on the chair. I kicked it. I wrestled with it. I rolled around on the floor with it. I tore it apart right there in front of everyone. Everyone got up, running away from the destructive act. There were paparazzi taking photos. The image was reproduced in all the newspapers. This was my first event, and I took it very seriously. I had never thought of myself before as competing in the art world, although my attitude has always been heroic. I've always wanted to get the gold medal. So not to be outdone by the Brits, the New Yorkers organized their own destruction and art symposium. In 1968, Judson Church, and it's adjoining gallery. Uh, these were on, this was on Thompson Street in the heart of Greenwich Village. Hosted the event. Ten American artists were to participate, as were a group of artists from abroad. As part of the New York Symposium, the artists organized a series of events titled Twelve Evenings of Manipulation." As in London, much media attention accompanied the New York Symposium. Attempts to understand the artists' motivation and their thoughts were prevalent. These include careful descriptions of the events and interviews with the artists to clarify the process by which they were, they were developing their concepts and their performances. 
Ortiz's work was titled Destruction Room. It was described in the press as follows. This was a landscape beyond Artaud's theories into the crazed chambers of Artaud, Saad's, and Nero's minds. It started off, innocently enough, with a strobe light freezing the dancing, cascading soap suds in an open washer, with apples cooking in an electric frying pan, with clothing becoming slightly burnt by a woman ironing, with kids underfoot crunching plastic toys, smashing air-filled paper bags. Then, actual blood was handed out in paper cups. It was poured and smeared everywhere. To the tapes of heartbeat and presumably primitive rites, Ortiz and an assistant cut the projected images of vital organs, spilling blood on the fissures as they cut through the paper. There was a bloodlust energy set loose. The journalist then connects the chaotic ambiance of the performance and his wish to escape as quickly as possible to the numbers of dead in Vietnam. Indeed, for the artists involved in both of these events, the escalating violence and loss of life around the world was a main concern. Ortiz described the motivation behind destruction art succinctly when he was interviewed by Newsweek in May 1968. He stated, <coughs> destruction art is the symbolic artistic realization of all the inherent hostile destructive urges that have placed mankind in crisis since the beginning. We are all natural Nazis, fascists, murderers, full of repressions and hate. Instead of pouring out our natural aggressions on people, we should use them in an artistic framework on objects and animals. So the way in which Montañez Ortiz thinks, which comes directly from his artistic methodology, has deeply influenced the development of El Museo del Barrio. The early history of the museum is closely tied to uh, civil rights movements, including sit-ins, public demonstrations, strikes, and boycotts that were held in New York City between 1964 and 1969. African-American and Puerto Rican parents, teachers, and community activists in Central and East Harlem demanded that their children, who by 1967 composed the majority of the public school population, receive an education that acknowledged and addressed their diverse cultural heritages. So Ortiz was already teaching in the public school system. He had a PhD in art ed education. And the commissioner of the school board came to him and said, you know, we need curriculum for our students because they're not learning about Puerto Rican history and culture in the classroom. Can you write this curriculum? And he had the foresight to say, I can write this curriculum, but let's also found a museum. So the museum was founded first in a classroom, first on the west side of Harlem, and then moved to different places, storefronts, other classrooms in East Harlem, and finally to its location on Fifth Avenue in the mid-1980s. Um, and he was the director, the founding director, serving from June 1969 to spring 1971. And when he founded the museum, the idea was that it would be a, a space for Puerto Ricans in the diaspora. It was a New Yorican museum. Um, but already by 1972, 73, when the uh, playwright and poet Jack Agueros became the director, he felt, he felt that the museum had to respond to a larger growing population of Latin American immigrants, and the focus became a little bit broader. So moment two is about the work of Agustin Fernandez and his move from Cuba through Paris during sort of the end of surrealism in the 1960s to Puerto Rico where he lived for four years before finally moving to New York in 1972. And in this part, I want to make a, a connection between the work of Fernandez and two different things. Um, the history of punk and the way it develops in New York City in the downtown scene and also to the photography of Robert Maplethorpe. Downtown New York, the space between 14th Street and the southern tip of Manhattan, is described by historians as follows. In the mid-1970s, a distinctively new attitude towards artistic production surfaced in downtown New York. It was not a new aesthetic, not a new style, and not a unified movement, but rather an attitude toward the possibilities and production of art. Influenced by the symbolists, the beats, New York school, the situationists, by Dada, pop, hippies, Marxists, and anarchists, downtown New York artists sought to push the limits of traditional categories of art. 
downtown works undermine the tradition of art, music, performance, and writing at the most basic structural levels. Rather than overthrow traditional forms and establish a new movement, downtown works sought to undermine from within the traditional structures of artistic media and the cultures that had grown up around them. This scene, ever growing and changing with new demographics molding the city and its culture, became the backdrop to the paintings of Agustin Fernandez and the new home of his family when they moved to a place just north of Washington Square Park at 5th Avenue and 11th Street. In images of the downtown New York scene, we see some of the signals that will become important in Fernandez's work. Stark contrasts of masculinity and femininity, hard and soft, gay and straight. By the mid-1970s, the music scene in New York had evolved to foster a sound of its own and an aesthetic that accompanied it. And one of the New York Times music critics talks about it. New York rockers, he said, are cool, detached, alienated, even in the profession of passion. Long gone are the explicitly political enthusiasms of the 60s or the summer of love sentimentality or folk-based humanism or even the glitter outrageousness of just a few years ago. These bands are angry, but their anger turns inward in despair. They cling to humor and solitary mysticism and distant attitudinizing as masks against the grimness of urban life. So this is just to give you some of that grit and urban life uh, ambiance from the 1970s in New York. And I think surely this kind of grimness that you encountered in the 1970s must have um, inspired Agustin Fernandez when he moved to New York. His son talked about how he liked to walk a lot, take long walks, and so he would go to Pearl Paint, which was at the southern end of Soho. His house was at the north end of the village, so he had to cross all of the village and all of Soho in order to get to Pearl Paint. And I think he probably encountered posters like this on the side of nightclubs that were being advertising local punk shows and punk bands. Um, and then these sort of contradictions that were represented by the public gestures of punk. Torn clothing, worn with thick boots and leather jackets, piercing in places never before considered, hair that defied gravity. These were all visible on the street, and reflections of these are prevalent throughout the artist's imagery. Here's just a sample of one of his drawings of one of his paintings from the period. During this period, Fernandez made paintings in which armor and armored objects occupy the principal space of the canvas. Like punk costume that was intended both to protect but also to perturb, his armored works reflect a kind of impenetrability that's both alluring and repellent. He shares this aesthetic paradox with the underground gay aesthetic and with Maplethorpe's photos of the 1970s. The work of both artists is marked by challenges to the norms of culture and social expectations, as well as some adherence to the legacy of classicism, especially where the body is concerned. Here's another really great image. I found this advertising from a Japanese magazine that shows a front and back image of uh, a punk leather jacket. And you, you can see how much um, this could have influenced what Agustin Fernandez was painting in his own works. Maplethorpe's attenuated and pale figure, his preference for leather and metal-studded accessories, t-shirts or athletic tanks, and heavy boots, all underscore his adherence to the codes of New York street fashions of the various underground scenes, both gay and straight. And in a kind of related note, um, by 1975, Patti Smith, who was his companion, was almost sort of like an underground punk guy. They had already been in a relationship since the late 1960s, so I think that you know, his knowledge of that scene, as well as the artistic scene, was very intimate at this time, or by the, by the time that he met Agustin Fernandez. And just to illustrate how close the relationship was, they visited each other's studios uh, all the time. And this is a photograph of a party uh, that's gone out onto the fire escape. So Maplethorpe's in the center, and then this face right here, the profile that you see is Agustin Fernandez. The intersection of pleasure and pain of tension and relaxation is seen in both a gelatin silver print by Maplethorpe and a painting by Fernandez. In Maplethorpe's Patrice from 1977, we see a kind of a portrait shot from the waist down and focusing our view on her nether regions, which are covered by the soft ribbed cotton fabric of a jockstrap and framed at the top by the straps, buckles, and studs of a wide leather belt. 
In Fernandez's painting, made only two years later, soft, round, fleshy forms are strapped down by a series of leather belts that weave their way across the forms and across the canvas. Separated by each strap of leather, the forms become more vulnerable and yet contradictory, fleshy and metallic, malleable and hard, just like Patrice, and sharing affinities with the aesthetics of punk. In drawings from the 1970s and 80s, flesh and rubber, leather, or some other form of binding often coexist. He shows a cephalic form that seems likely to burst from its binding, a slick, rubber-like material that only serves simultaneously to engorge and to restrain its fleshy content. And he did this also in a drawing. This is a nice pairing also where you see um, in 1980, the early 1980s, he's doing these kind of drawings where body parts that aren't completely identifiable, they sort of allude to different kinds of body parts, are strapped down with these straps that have like a, a sheen to them. It could be shiny leather, it could be metallic. And then just three years later, Robert Maplethorpe's pictures of the bodybuilder and athlete Lisa Lyon, where she, he shows her body specifically kind of strapped up in a similar way. In another reference to punk and other subcultures, Fernandez often featured representations of razor blades, knives, or other elongated metallic objects. He first used these images in Paris in the 1960s. However, he made numerous drawings featuring an abundance of razor blades throughout the 1970s, surely because they were ubiquitous in the local popular culture of his time. This kind of object used within a body of work that also includes references to pieces of leather or scraps of lace becomes increasingly meaningful in the cultural context of downtown New York. He used razor blades in the 1960s and sort of always talked about how he liked them for their absolute ordinariness. He says, they're everyday objects. There is nothing dangerous about them. He was always being asked about them when he was being interviewed. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that he was interested in the razor blade, and he encountered it in two moments where it was like a, an iconic facet of movements like surrealism and like punk. So he was in Paris in when surrealism is sort of and dwindling. Right? And then he's in New York when the punk movement is burgeoning, both of which are interested in this idea of the danger of the, the razor blade. Moment three looks more specifically at the New Yorican experience and the photography of Sofia Rivera. Sofia Rivera began working in photography in the 1970s and had her first solo exhibition in 1978. It was an exhibition of portraits of important Latin people in New York society, which was um, often a way that many young photographers got their first solo exhibition doing portraits of important people of Latin American descent worked in, who were working in New York. She studied at the New School for Social Research as well as at the Art Students League, and she also got a scholarship to the Eperion Workshop where she studied with the photographer Lisette Modell. There's a couple of examples of her works here. She was influenced by her eye for photographing figures, especially in an urban uh, context. Um, in the past, she had also worked frequently as a freelance photographer for a variety of lefty publications, including the Village Voice, but also the Daily News um, and something like the Liberation News Service. As a photographer, she was acutely aware of the limitations of gender difference and how it had affected her production and the production of other women artists particularly Puerto Ricans and Latinas. She said, artistic talent and intellectual vigor are commodities not appreciated in Latina women as they are growing up in the Latino community, which is, of course, primarily patriarchal, unquote. This questioning of the status quo led her to publish the article, Women, Where Are They in the History of Photography? in the April 1984 issue of Art and Artists. She discusses a number of books, sort of new publications that explore the history of photography, and she takes an inventory of how many women photographers are included in this book, and of course the numbers were dismal. Needless to say, her interest in highlighting this gender disparity was predated by her ongoing efforts to correct the lack of representation of Puerto Ricans in visual culture. In the early 1980s, the, the artist addressed the conventions of the studio portrait and used her own home as the backdrop. In her most widely praised series, 
Rivera's conviction that Latinos, and particularly Puerto Ricans, were underrepresented in the art world inspired multiple projects in which Puerto Rican subjectivity became the focus of her work. This project was her attempt to represent those around her by pointing her lens at people both known and unknown, friends and strangers from her barrio. To find her, art at her subjects, she literally stood on the corner of her building and asked people who were walking by, first, if they were Puerto Rican, and second, if they would mind sitting for a portrait. And then she invited them into her home. Um, so imagine the kind of trust that you have to have in New York City in the 1970s to invite someone into your home in order to take a portrait. And I think you can feel that trust in the photographs themselves. Her project became a series of large-scale square format portraits that combined the realness of ordinary subjects with the monumentality of a large-scale image. Each figure is centered on a dark wooden background. Each is treated with eminent care and attention. The poses, the clothing, the faces, each feature underscores the natural comfort between the sitter and the artist. Almost like a halo, the reflected glow of light behind the heads of the figures adds another layer of signification. In this context, the hairstyles and the chosen articles of clothing reflect the diversity of the Latino community in West Harlem during this period. So for example, a young man's afro and vaguely military-styled jacket play their own roles as signs of the times. His kind and youthful face belies the pseudo-tough exterior insinuated in his clothing and in his pose. The photographer's skill at finding the exact moment at which to snap her sitter's picture is palpable. Differing from Modell's images of people in their urban environments, Rivera updates the tradition of the interior studio portrait. Rather than offering a range of backdrops, costume possibilities, or props, she pairs down the space to the absolute minimum, offering only the figure with its host of details as the one and only subject. In this way, each freckle, mole, wrinkle, or scar, curled or straightened hair, light or dark skin tone, becomes a bearer of meaning. A young woman wears her hair in the outward wing shape that was known back in the day as feathered. Another woman proudly wears a blouse that alludes to indigenous culture, the yoke and cuffs made from a pattern that recall Inca textiles. The dark circles under her eyes reveal multiple narratives, alluding to maybe Phoebe feeding a newborn in the middle of the night, working long hours on the job, or just struggling to make a life in the big city. Undaunted by her burdens, whatever they may be, she stands with her hands resting on the back of a chair, one shoulder slightly higher than the other. In addition to her indigenous roots, Africa remains a visible presence in her facial features. Like Richard Avedon's haunting, por haunting portraits of various sitters, the figure and the features bear the weight of meaning in Rivera's imagery. The sitter contributes to our reading through self-presentation, a kind of auto-interpretation that plays out before our eyes. By asking her subjects to come as they were, the artist added a narrative dimension that was shared by both, a collaboration, in a way, between the artist and the subject. My final artist is a New York-born Dominican artist named Elia Alba, whose career really started when she uh, was the recipient of the artist in residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, along with Manuela Acevedo, they were the, first, the two first Latino artists to be accepted into the studio residency. So she began to create these uh, uh, sculptures from fabric. Her works specifically address the complexities of miscegenation and the interpretation of the body as a product of multiple and competing characteristics. Alba's works consider the question addressed by Franz Fanon about existence and the phenotype of the outward appearance. How does a body become racialized? So just as a reminder, this is what Fanon said. Ontology, once it is finally admitted as leaving existence by the wayside, does not permit us to understand the being of the black man. For not only must the black man be black, he must be black in relation to the white man. Some critics will take it on themselves to remind us that this proposition has a converse. I say that this is false. 
the black man has no ontological resistance in the eyes of the white man. Overnight, the Negro has been given two frames of reference within which he has had to place himself. His metaphysics, or less pretentiously, his customs and the sources on which they were based, were wiped out because they were in conflict with a civilization that he did not know and that imposed itself on him." Unquote. So literal and imagined miscegenation is probably most evident in this work, uh, her three bodysuits, which are in the collection of El Museo. And they represent a white, a black, and a mixed body. So she manipulated the color of her own skin. She's originally trained as a photographer, and her career sort of started doing photography for theater companies. And to do this project, she decided she would photograph her own body, but then scan it into the computer so that she could then manipulate the skin tone. And she creates what I call kind of like a postmodern version of a casta painting. Does everybody know what these are? The casta painting is such a fascinating thing invented by um, the Spanish crown as a way to illustrate the kind of racial mixing that was happening in the New World. So these paintings, there were typically 16 versions of them, and it would show the people of two different races or ethnicities, a man and a woman, and their progeny. And each one had a kind of a name um, that identified uh, the person's race, which is interesting because, you know, as a reflection of that colonialism today in Dominican Republic, there still are specific names that are uh, matched to one's skin tone that are still used on things like driver's license and other official government documents. So um, this literal and imagined miscegenation um, makes kind of like a patchwork rendering of these races and also their subsequent mi uh, mixtures. These figures, self-portraits really, can be seen and understood in relation to a real human body. The photographic element serves to sort of underscore the realness of the image. In the video that accompanies these body suits, this is an image of it here on the bottom, um, they're made to enact various rituals while being linked directly to the work of women. So you see the hands of her mother who was helped her to stitch. Her mother worked in the uh, textile industry. She was working in a sweatshop when Elia was younger, and so she's helped her to stitch these bodysuits together. The title of the work, If I Were a... Dot, 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 leaves to the viewer's imagination the completion of the phrase. We are left to consider categories based on skin tone. How would these various colored bodies behave? Throughout her work, the artist explores the relationship between the fact of gender and the social gendering of the body. She mixes the genders of masks and performers, gestures and coverings, body and face. These portrait doll heads function as masks for people who are known and unknown, familiar and alien, who are encountered in the daily landscape of life. She places unexpected skin tones and, ge and genders together and applies both masquerade and performance to a single still image to reflect on the social construction of identity through the deeply flawed surface reading of race and gender. The inspiration for a later series came from David Wanarovich's works featuring himself wearing a mask with the face of Rambeau and seen at various New York City locations in both public and semi-private moments. Rambeau, an icon <clears throat> for the ultimate outsider, a renegade, a protagonist of scandals and a visionary poet, presides over these images of a New York City in 1978 and 1979, a post-Stonewall city in which art, love, sex, and drugs were plentiful, and the underground music scene was flourishing. The incongruity between Wanarovich's body and the scale of Rambo's face adds to this whimsical but also disturbing imagery. Alba's works replicate the use of the masking as a way to exist without revealing the true self. Placing her figures in a variety of scenarios, she takes up locations that are vaguely reminiscent of those in Wanderovich's imagery. And th in this example, we've surprised a couple in a public bathroom. The figures both wear a mask with the face of the disco era DJ, Larry Levan. The erotic pose, the form of the central female figure, and Levan's straightforward gaze recall the sensibility of Wanderovich's images. Here are sex, form, body, urgency, secrecy, intimacy, all bound up into a singular scene that hedges the difference between public and private, 
male and female, brown and black. So to end, I'm just going to briefly go into um, our biennial, which is probably our most loved and most well-known exhibition. The biennial began because uh, my former boss, the curator Deborah Cullen, realized that there was a need for especially younger artists to show their work at the museum. So when she started the biennial, there were really three roles, rules which we still sort of adhere to today. The artists um, could not be in the permanent collection, which meant they never would have shown probably at El Museo before. They had to be from the general New York City region, and they had to be of Latin American uh, or Caribbean descent, or born in the U.S. of Latin American Caribbean descent. Mm -hmm. And so it started in 1999, and uh, next year, in January, will be the ninth version of the biennial. Um, and for that one, we've decided to invite 100 curators to each select one artist, mm -hmm. and we'll include 100 artists in the biennial. And so for that reason, we've spread it a little bit, so it's not just New York-based, but artists from other parts of the U.S. will also be participating in that show. But for this version, I'll talk about briefly, we're just interested in the history of the street and of street art. And this started because um, we noticed that, well, I think this is sort of intuitive, artists uh, don't have money, so it's expensive to make artwork. It's much more expensive to buy a tube of paint than it is to pick up something off the sidewalk that someone else has discarded and use it to create a sculpture. And so led by what artists were already doing, we started thinking about the street as a place of activity, social, political, and artistic activity, and the history of street art in New York City. So um, we thought about the history of graffiti and graffiti writers who sort of like had their flash in the gallery scene in the 1980s, but then sort of never made it into this historic narrative of American art the grittiness of New York City, and the kind of um, political gestures that were enacted in the streets of New York historically. And thinking about things like, you know, you don't have a gallery, no problem. Just paint the side of a subway car. Your art will be going through the boroughs, right? Do you not have a record contract? It's OK. You've got your turntables. You've got your boom box. You can cut a record and become a, a DJ. So it was a kind of like do-it-yourself culture. And then we thought about artists who had used the streets of New York as inspiration. This is Gordon Mata Clark's series uh, of photographs of the New York City subway, to which, which he then hand colored onto the surface of the photograph. Someone like Adrian Piper's Mythical Being performances, where she dressed as a man and cat called women on the street just to see sort of what would happen, to see like how the interaction would feel from the other side of gender, um, but also get into scuffles with men. Papo Golo, who was a Puerto Rican artist who was um, active in New York in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And this is one of his walking sculptures where he took a piece you know, of wood that he found on the street and then went to the hardware store to add more things to it. And he literally moved it down the sidewalks of Soho. And then this is his performance piece from 1977 where um, on the, the West Side Highway, which is, of course, now really used constantly. There's always traffic jams on the West Side Highway, but in the 70s apparently had been built maybe too early and the lanes were a little too narrow, so it was really underused. And he did this fantastic endurance performance where he died, tied 51 pieces of wood to his body and ran until he couldn't run anymore on the side of the West Side Highway. So thinking about those people, but also, um, you know, the history of graffiti. This is Taki 183, who by 1977 was already being um, interviewed by the New York Times, and he talked about how the way he started tagging was just to use his nickname and the street number that he was from, his neighborhood. And he acknowledged that there was a precursor, Julio from 204th Street, who tagged everywhere, and that's sort of how that tagging began. So we started thinking about that and this history of um, performance and music and kind of self-made projects, um, the importance of fashion mode during the period, um, and then we included some of the old timers from the graffiti years. Lee Quinones, this is one of his subway cars from 1979. He does easel painting now, gigantic easel painting, so we had some of those in the show. Um, and then a younger generation of artists we invited also. This is Cope too, and his partner Indy, um, 184, who did a piece in our cafe. And the thing about this is it's a fantastic wall. It's huge, and it faces these windows that look out onto Fifth Avenue with Central Park right across the street. And they're five giant arched windows. So it's almost like the galleries on the street. You can see it from the outside. 
And it's a great space because more people go into the cafe than go into the galleries. So there are more people who are going to see this artwork than maybe might see the actual <laughs> exhibition. So they were thrilled to have it. And then we thought about expanding and sort of diversifying our audience and how could we do that by going to Times Square. So we went to the Times Square Alliance <laughs> and asked if um, they would give us an afternoon where we could organize some live performances. And so this is one of the performances by the um, El Salvadoran artist Irvin Morazan, who lives and works in, in New York. Um, and he's doing his performance at the center of the world where he used a piece that was actually in the exhibition. So this was a sculpture that he had made from a boombox, a plastic coyote, some chains from the hardware store that he painted. Um, and then this work was deinstalled so that he could use it in the performance in Times Square. And he collaborated with a car club from Queens, inviting them to bring some of their low riders so that he could be sort of like the shaman who's leading the low rider in this ritualistic dance in the center of Times Square. And then we had um, more political kind of street interventions also that were the work of Alicia Grullon, a Puerto Rican and Dominican artist from the Bronx who had been studying the um, murders of undocumented workers in the New Jersey and New York and Connecticut region over the previous two years between 2008 and 2010. And she sort of reenacted some of these scenes as they were uh, photographed in the newspapers. And then, as I said, a lot of people who were rescuing things from the street in order to create sculptures. This is Janelle Iglesias. Her piece is called Bridge and Tunnel, Kids Have More Fun, The Return of La Morena. And bridge and tunnel is a pejorative term that Manhattanites use for everyone who doesn't live in Manhattan because they have to take a tunnel <laughs> or a bridge to get to Manhattan. And so they're sort of demoted to a different class of person. Um, and they're from Hollis, Queens, which is one of the most diverse neighborhoods in New York City. Their um, mother is Norwegian, their father is Dominican. And one of the things that Janelle says she remember from her youth is these cans of La Morena, the jalapenos, especially the pickled jalapenos that were always in the house. And so she adapted these for her work. And the rest of it is really uh, saved, rescued from a piano company that was going out of business. And they were dumping all these piano parts uh, behind their building. So she rescued them to make a sculpture out of them. And then works like this, also site specific, these are um, used skateboards, which the artist uh, Sofia Maldonado encouraged skateboard riders to bring and recycle at local skate shops around New York City. And then she brought them to the museum, made these fabulous paintings, and then a painting installation around the side of it. And then um, someone like Johanna Hunsueta, who was hand making these car rims. She had been working in Queens at a, a neighborhood called Willits Point, which is a neighborhood where historically car repair shops, but also shops that cater to people who want to make their cars fancier, have their businesses. And in some cases, you'd have entire walls like this installed with these fancy rims that would cost thousands of dollars, but were a needed accessory for cars, especially in the late 90s and the 2000s. So she created these, stitching them by hand from a very thick, heavy industrial kind of felt, the kind of felt that Joseph Boys would have used. But I think so interestingly, bringing women's work and craft and the handmade into it. And then finally, the last artist I'll show you is um, Frida Le Baez, who is now having a solo show at the Betis Art Museum in Miami. And this is um, her piece, Can I Pass? Introducing the brown paper bag test to the fan test for the month of December. So she documented her silhouette over a month or two, um, and specifically with attention to the texture of the hair. So you see some days when she had just come straight from the salon, it looks very neat and sleek. And then a couple of days later, once she's gotten a little moisture into it, it goes back to its natural curls. Does anyone know what the brown paper bag test is? It's an American thing. In the 19, beginning in the 30s and 40s, in African American communities, um, admittance to parties and social clubs would sometimes be measured by comparing one's skin to a brown paper bag. And if you were lighter than brown paper bag, you could come into the party or the social club. And if not, you couldn't. And there is an equivalent in Dominican Republic called the fan test. And uh, this is an old law that's still on the books in Dominican Republic where a man could divorce his wife if when she stood by a fan, her hair didn't flow easily. <laughs> Again, referring to the amount of African blood that one, one carried. So um, I'll just show you a couple of uh, a details which are fantastic where you really see the silhouette of the hair mm -hmm. and how um, 
she's focused us on that silhouette, but also on the intensity of the gaze, which is returned in each of these self-portraits of the 31 days of December. Thank you.